Um, but if you will, um, open your Bibles, if you will, to Matthew chapter 11, St. Matthew chapter 11. We began a series a few weeks ago entitled Running with the Giants. Amen? Come on, how many of you want to run with giants? And every Sunday and every Wednesday, we've been talking about some of the giants in the Bible that we get to run with, and they're part of the great cloud of witnesses that I believe they're cheering us on from heaven. I believe that there is... Uh, 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 some some interaction there. And so um, we get to run with the giants. I kicked off this series talking about Jonathan. And uh, uh, Rachel told me when I, I, I started picking my giants, she said, well, one thing about it, because different people and, and different preachers and teachers in the church pick different giants. But she said, one thing about it, nobody's going to compete with your giants, Okay. Because nobody thought about Jonathan, and I'm going to talk about one today that nobody was going to pick. And the one I almost, I almost chose, Trenda, uh, John, uh, John the Revelator, the Apostle John. I almost, and if I get a chance in this series, I want to preach about John because most of you, probably none of you have ever heard a sermon on John. Everybody talks about Peter. Everybody talks about the Apostle Paul. But I'm telling you, the Apostle John is somebody we need to talk about. He gave us five books of the Bible. He gave us John 3, 16. He gave us the book of Revelations. There's just so much. They listen. He was so he was the he was the I'm, I'm, here I'm preaching on him. Okay, so you're gonna get some. He was the apostle of love, and they couldn't kill him. Why? Because you can't kill love. Amen. They boiled him. They tried to boil him to death and all, and still couldn't kill him. And uh, finally threw him out on the island, and that's when he wrote the book of Revelation. But just some some great great giants in the Bible that we get to study. But today I'm going to talk about John the Baptist. Thank you for all your enthusiasm. I know the, the internet audience, they're shouting. I know they are. But some of you thought, you know, I would never probably put him on your list. But I am going to talk about John the Baptist. Why am I going to talk about John the Baptist? Jesus said he's the greatest of the great. Thank you for all the amens again. And if Jesus said he's the greatest of the great, then he beats every, listen, wh whoever in this uh, watch in or any of our other preachers and teachers of the church, I, I, I'm, I get, to, listen, none of them are as good as my guy today. Amen? I know I said that about Jonathan, but then I had to go back and change my doctrine, okay? Okay, but I said that about Jonathan because, you know, David became a king, but Jonathan was a king maker. Come on, we want to be king makers, not just try to be a king. Everybody can fight to be a king. That's normal and natural, but it's beyond natural and it's supernatural to give away everything you have so someone else can become a king. Ooh, shout amen one time. That's why I want to run with Jonathan. But we've been talking about Esther, still talking about Esther. Why? Because I'm telling you, the spirit of Haman is let loose in the earth. A spirit of corruption. He was a political guy who twisted and turned things in such a way that he lied to the king, he, he, he was corrupt, he was a liar, he was against everything that was godly in that nation. He wanted to kill it. He wanted to kill the godliness in Persia at that time. He did it and he did it secretly and he did it underhandedly and he was deceptive and he was a liar and he was corrupt and he was a politician. Need I say more? Come on, shout amen. And if the spirit of Haman is let loose on the earth, then the spirit of Esther better come on the church. That's what stopped the Haman. Amen? And we, that's, I'm not preaching that. I've I'm, I'm, I'm got to get back on my guy. Okay, here we go. John the Baptist. Remember, the other thing is God will not be outdone. I keep telling you prophetically. I said it last Sunday or the last Sunday I was here, God will not be outdone. What's the prophetic word? I told you the prophetic word for 2020 was buckle up. Well, the new prophetic word for 2020 is God will not be outdone. That's why His glory is going to be waiting for you in the church, in your house, in your car. You're going to see more glory, more power, more miracles, more of everything because God will not be outdone. And you guys are going to be king makers, not just kings. And the spirit of Esther is coming on Family Faith Church. And for that reason, I'm literally proclaiming a fast. In the month of September, I am. I, I know, thank you for all that excitement. Okay, 
Pastor Jeff, it's not January. It's 31 o'clock. Now you're cheating, Pastor Jeff. You're cheating. You're breaking protocol. Come on. You're breaking the religious system with family-fed church. Michael Slaughter started this years ago, this fasting stuff. He came up to me one time and said, Pastor Jeff, I feel led to fast. I said, Micah, good for you. And, uh, and literally, and, and, and I, this literally happened. And so, man, it got in me and it got on me. And that was the first fast I've ever called. I, I didn't feel the liberty to do it as a pastor. I want you to do what you do and I do what I do. Eileen's the faster in our family. Come on, every family has a faster. Amen? Come on. Somebody shout out. <laughs> but anyways, no, I really feel, guys, that sometimes you can't just wait for January to roll around. Sometimes there needs to be the body of Christ that stands in and not just prays and not just preaches and not just sings. I believe that America and the world, especially America right now, needs God's people to be God's people. So I'm proclaiming a fast in September. Once again, go, just go ahead and clap and act like you're happy, okay? Just act like you're happy. Why? Because the spirit of Esther must come on the church. Amen, amen, amen. We're going to keep moving. Amen. That went over real well, Eileen. That was great. I can't wait to get to Willis, okay? Went over great in Huntsville. I can tell we got a lot of happy folks here. Man. So, uh, so you found it by now, I believe, uh, Matthew chapter 11, verse 2. And when John had heard in the prison that the works of Christ he sent two of his disciples and said unto him art thou he or should we come um, uh, are, uh, he said unto them are you he that should come or do we look for another <laughs> Jesus answered said unto them go show John again those things which you do hear and see the blind receive the sight the lame walk the lepers are cleansed the deaf hear the dead are raised up the poor have the gospel preached to them um, proof that Jesus Christ is who he says he is, and this is, he's just quoting Isaiah is all he's doing here. He just sent the word. Proof that Jesus was still in the earth. The blind received their sight. The lame walk. The lepers are cleansed. The deaf hear. The dead are raised up. And the poor have the gospel preached unto them. And blessed is he whosoever shall not be offended in me. I'm waiting for an amen. As they, as they departed, notice they left. They left. By the way, John never got the real message. Listen, when you come late and leave early, you miss some stuff. You can come late and leave early other places like family reunions and stuff and anything else, whatever it might be, come late and leave early except for your job. Amen, don't ever do that. But, but come late and leave early, but don't come late to church and leave early. Amen, come early and leave late. Amen, they came late and left early. They departed. John's d disciples departed. With the word of God, thank God they got the word. They began to say unto the multitudes concerning John, What went ye out into the wilderness to see? A reed shaken? But what went ye out to see? A man clothed in soft raiment? Behold, they that wear soft clothing are in king's houses. But what went ye out to see? A prophet? Yea, I say unto you, more than a prophet. For this is he of whom it is written, Behold, I send my messenger before your face, which shall prepare thy way before thee. Verily I say unto you, among them that are born of women, there hath not arisen a greater than John the Baptist, notwithstanding he that is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. Let me re read verse 11 again, just so you all know. Uh, Jesus said, those that are born of the women, there's none greater. So whoever preaches on whoever from here on out and in the past, I got number one. Amen? Come on. How many of you agree with Jesus' doctrine? He said John the Baptist is the greatest. So, Gary, I, I, I picked El Numero Uno, okay? Verse 12, And from the days of John the Baptist until now the kingdom of heaven suffered with violence, and the violent take it by force. For all the prophets and the law prophesied until John. And if you can receive it, verse 14, this is Elias, this is the Elijah, which was for to come. And he that hath ears to hear, let him hear. So, let's talk about this giant called John, the, we call him John the Baptist, Baptist. some other denominations call him John uh, the Forerunner, some other groups, Christian groups call him John the Baptizer, um, we probably in our circles more know him more as John the Bapti uh, Baptist, um, John reminds us, first of all he had a miracle birth, His, uh, he's the, he's the uh, son of Zechariah and Elizabeth, Zechariah was a priest, he was a Jewish priest in a synagogue, and um, he um, 
and, and it was a religious leader, and they were barren, and they couldn't have children, and now they were above age to have children, but yet supernaturally, uh, he was born. How many of you know John reminds us that all of us need a supernatural birth that revolves around Jesus Christ? Come on, everybody needs that. You, everybody, if you're watching on the internet and you've never been born again, you need a supernatural birth that revolves around Jesus. Come on, clap right there in, in Huntsville. Come on, clap. We all need a supernatural birth that revolves around Jesus. He was the third cousin of Jesus. He introduced Jesus as the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world, prophesied it. He was very, very anointed, very gifted, and an amazing speaker, so much that people by the droves would go out and listen to him speak out in the woods and the wilderness and the desert. He was anointed by God to tell the world that Jesus Christ was the Messiah. And that's what his, his calling was. He was born for the purpose of telling people his whole life. In other words, he was the forerunner to come. And that's what he was anointed to do. But then his circumstances changed in this particular chapter. And he was put in prison. And he had told Herod that, he, you know, no, you cannot have your brother's wife. And there's a whole other message there that I've never preached and I may never get into. But let me just say this. All I'm going to say is one statement and, and then I'm going to move on. It's so important to stay in your calling. And I'll keep moving. Amen? And, and, and so... Uh, Circumstances changed, and he was in prison, and uh, and so um, he began to question whether or not Jesus was really the Messiah in this particular chapter. He sent his, he's in prison. He sent his disciples and said, man, uh, by the way, Jesus, are you really the one, or are we looking for another? Come on now. John, you, you, anybody can doubt this, but you better not. In other words, if, if he's questioned whether or not his entire life is a wasted endeavor, because that's all he lived for his whole life, was to tell the world that Jesus is the Messiah. He's coming. He's coming. And finally, he was baptized. He heard the words come from heaven. He saw the dove, and he heard words scream and thunder from heaven that said, This is my beloved Son in whom I'm well pleased. He heard it with his own ears. He was anointed every day to tell people that this is the Messiah. Then he gets in a difficult moment and he doubts the very thing that he could never doubt. Come on, John, everybody else can doubt it, but you can't. It's like Tom Brady really doubting whether or not football is really a sport. Amen? It's like George Foreman telling everybody that grilling is for sissies. Like Colonel Sanders saying, you can't fry chicken. Amen. It's like Chick-fil-A saying, eat more beef. You just don't hear those kind of words coming from those kind of people. Because they live for something. Their passion, their life, their livelihood, everything about who they are is about something different. And that kind of verbiage doesn't come out of that kind of mouth. Come on. He was born for this. He was anointed for this. He lived for this. So let's just talk for a moment about John. Just going to give you a few statements about this, 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 this giant that we get to run with. Number one, according to Jesus, that John the Baptist was the Elias to come. It was prophesied in Malachi and Isaiah and other places that, that there would be a forerunner that would come right before the Messiah came there would be a forerunner that would prepare the way so people would not miss the Messiah when he finally came. And it was prophesied, and all the Jews knew this. Anyone that was religious and studied the Bible, they all that's why when Jesus tried to tell him, he said, I don't think you guys can receive this, but I'm telling you, this is the guy that they talked about in the Old Testament, and y'all been looking for him, and guess what? You missed him because you were looking in the temple and looking in the synagogue, and he was out there in the desert eating wild locusts and honey and wearing camel's hair, and you missed him. If you, can, if you can receive it, that was the guy. He was the forerunner. He was the one that came through like a whirlwind pointing that I am the Messiah and that he was the Elisha to come. And why do I say this? The reason I say it is because, listen, 
this generation is the Elisha of not the first coming of Jesus, but of the second coming of Jesus. Now, this is a prophetic point I'm giving you right now. The same anointing that was on John the Baptist is on the church for this generation and this generation only. That we are the forerunner. How many of you believe Jesus is coming soon? How many of you believe the rapture is going to happen soon? Listen, the church today is the forerunner. We have the same anointing. We have the Elijah anointing to tell the world that Jesus Christ is about to come. We have a prophetic anointing just like John the Baptist did. There are similarities between John the Baptist and Elijah. There are similarities. Number one, they were both bold. So guess what? The church of the last days that's willing to walk in the Elisha, John the Baptist anointing is going to be bold to stand up for truth even when it's so persecuted even and both of them were severely attacked by the political world of their day. Herod and then, and then, and then King Ahab and, and, and the Queen Jezebel all the, all the attacks came against them, and but yet they stood up and they both of them maintained boldness and stood with righteousness. So listen, and there's many others. There's 14 different similarities between, between these two guys and we need to understand that the anointing of Elisha is on the church today. The anointing of John the Baptist is on the church today. We are the forerunners to remind the world. You see, uh, uh, John the Baptist pointed, Jesus, Jesus, Jesus is coming, Jesus is coming, Jesus is coming. I'm telling you, he's right around the corner. He's, he's coming, he's here. The Messiah is here, he's here. He prepared the way. You and I, our job as being the forerunner of the second coming of of Christ is to let the world know Jesus is coming. Jesus is coming. He's almost here. We're the, we have that same anointing. And listen, that anointing will be a strong, powerful anointing that will be on the church if we dare walk in it. And it's the entire body of Christ that will walk in that if we're willing to walk in it. Amen? He was the forerunner of the first coming. We are the forerunner of the second coming of Christ and it's not next year or the next decade it's now it is right now amen number two the thing that interests me is that when John sent his disciples over and and you need to know you have to know this Jesus did not tell his disciples oh yeah I'm the one he never even said to John's disciples oh I'm the one let me send a letter back to you and so I can sign it and he can just be reminded or let me do something special or whatever Jesus didn't do anything special you know what Jesus did he sent the, the, the book of Isaiah he quoted Isaiah and said go back and tell John what Isaiah says the lame are healed the sick and the poor preach. he said go and literally he sent the word And can I tell you that when you go through a situation and you're looking for help, can I tell you what God's going to send? He's going to send His Word. And if you can't take Him in His Word, you can't take Him any other way. Because it's faith in His Word that works miracles. It's faith in His Word that moves mountains. It's faith in what He says that moves the mountains. It's not because you see a cloud over here or an angel over here or you see, you know, some little supernatural thing in your car. No, none of that means anything. It's faith in His Word and He'll always send His Word and that's what moves the mountains in your life. And He will always send His Word just like He did to John the Baptist. Number three. We learn through the ministry of Jesus and from this great giant is that you are doing better than you think you are. Amen. The internet audience, I'm going to say it to you now. <laughs> You're doing better than you think you are. I know COVID's happening. I know things aren't looking too good. You may feel like John the Baptist right now. You may feel like you're locked up in bondage and you're in chains of difficulty and chains of your past. You may feel like that you're in a prison of pain or in a prison of addiction or some other bondage, but I'm telling you, you're doing better than you think you are. If we learn anything from this story is you are doing better than you think. You may not be where you want to be or even where you ought to be, but thank God you're not where you used to be either. You're not where you used to be in Jesus' name. Amen. So stop depreciating yourself. 
Quit letting the enemy beat you up and stop depreciating yourself. Because what the enemy wants to do is he wants to discourage you. I mean, through this whole thing, maybe you've lost your job. Maybe other things have come. Maybe you, you, you're tr- dealing with physical uh, issues that are going on. There's a lot of things going on in our world right now. There's a lot of moving parts. But the enemy wants you to get discouraged, and especially through difficult times. He wants to accuse you and then make you accuse yourself so that he keeps accusing you and you buy into that accusation and then you start accusing yourself because ultimately he wants to make you quit. Always remember the devil's ultimate goal is to make you quit serving God. And that's the only way he can win. The only way he can put you in checkmate is if you quit serving God. But as long as you keep serving God, you will eventually put him in checkmate. Ecclesiastes chapter 3 talks about 28 different times and seasons. A time to laugh, a time to cry, a time to sow, a time to reap, a time to dance, a time to speak, a time to shut up, a time to this and a time to that. But you know in the midst of all the 28, there's never in anywhere in there where it says there's a time to quit. Because there's never a time to quit. You never quit. Just don't. If you don't quit, you win. When it's talking about serving God, just keep serving the Lord. Keep showing up. Keep serving the Lord, even if you don't understand, even if there's confusion, even if you're battling, even if, you know, Sister Bucket Mouth will not shut up, amen? And Brother Sandpaper has wore you down. Do not stop serving God. Don't ever use anybody else as an excuse for you to quit serving God. Ever. Because they will never qualify for your excuse. If you stop serving God, it wasn't because of the deacon, the preacher, or the televangelist. It's because you chose to stop serving the one who created you and the one who died for you. Come on, you can clap louder than that. Amen? It's never a season to quit. You're doing better than you think you are. I'm reminded of a story of of, of a pastor and uh, his... Uh, uh, one of the his uh, as actually his uh, his um, head usher kept wanting him to come watch his son play football well the one son finally graduated and the pastor never made it to the game doesn't that sound like a good pastor he said but my younger son's playing now the pastor oh my god now I gotta listen to this one so the younger son he's starting to play football now and he goes all the way to he's a senior Finally, the head usher came and said, Pastor, if you don't come watch him play now, you'll never get a chance because he's not getting his college scholarship. <laughs> he's not that good. <laughs> so he finally goes to a game. New Caney Eagles. Now I know why the pastor didn't go. Amen? New Caney can't win. A, they couldn't. I'm going to know back in the day, they couldn't buy a game. Amen? Anyways, if you're from New Caney, I'm sorry. If you're watching from New Caney, you know I'm telling the truth. You know I'm telling the truth. But anyways, um, they, uh, he finally goes to a game, and, and, and the guy's name was Jeffrey. And Jeffrey never even hardly got in the game at all. It's like, man, this is embarrassing. Finally, they put him in the game to, to, to do a, a, a punt return. And so they, he catches the ball. He actually catches the ball. It's a good thing. And he, and he runs over here, and he runs over here, and literally like the whole team just sacks him and just literally dog piles him. And the pastor thought, I'm going to have to go raise this kid from the dead, man. He'd, and he didn't even gain one yard. I think he lost a yard, actually. And then the pastor's kind of ducking his head thinking, man, this is so embarrassing. This is so embarrassing. And, 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 and I don't know what to say. Maybe I can console this father and so he doesn't feel disappointed with his son because his son obviously didn't even gain a yard. It's embarrassing. And the dad jumps up right before the pastor's about to just kind of make an excuse for the son. The dad jumps up and said, did you see those two moves? Did you see those two moves? Did you see? And did you? He was literally so proud of his son because he went like this and he went like that and then he got completely. And he said, did you see those two moves? And let me tell you something. That's how it is in life many times. We think all God sees is us being tackled and us gaining no yards and even we feel like we're losing yards. 
But God is the one that's standing up to the angels and standing up and saying, Gabriel, did you see those two moves? Did you see them try? Did you see them get up and go to church? Yeah, they didn't do everything perfect, but did you see, they made it to church on Sunday. They watched, they didn't make it to church, but they ate post toasties and watched from their lounger this Sunday. Did you see the two moves? You're doing better than you think you are. Come on, look at your neighbor and say, I really do think you're doing better than you think you are. Come on, I dare you to tell them. Amen. Number two is you matter more than you think you do. You matter more than you think you do. John was in prison. He obviously wasn't able to speak to the masses anymore. Imagine being the number one traveling evangelist in Israel at the time. Number one, no doubt, traveling itinerant evangelist in Israel one day and the next day you're in prison. And you're in prison day after day after day. But can I tell you, you matter more than you think you do. Even if you feel like you're in bondage or in a prison, you may feel like I'm, you say, Pastor Jeff, I'm no longer important. Listen, you matter more than you think you do. You matter more than you think you do. In America, you matter more than you think you do. Your prayers can change a nation. Amen? Your faith can change a whole nation. That's why Freddie gave me this quote years ago, and, and, and I still use it, but the only way for evil to triumph is for good men to do nothing. Edmund Burke. And, and it's true. You matter. You matter. You need to know that you matter so you can stand up and be who you are and do what you can. Oh, I'm not Pastor Jeff, and I don't get to do this, that, and the other. Yeah, but you are who you are, and you matter to God, and you matter to America, and you matter to people, and you matter. See, sometimes when things go wrong, we begin to question our value. Things don't go right. Things go bad in our business. Things go bad at our job. We begin to uh, we get just laid off or we get fired or, or things don't go so well and uh, we began to lose money over here. Or that, and then suddenly we, been to, we began to question our value because of things that happen. The number one question people always ask if they meet somebody, what do you do? What do you do? In other words, people always tie you to what you do. In other words, what, what do you do? What, what kind of job do you have? It seems like always the number one question. But can I tell you that you are more than your job? I mean, your job does not make you who you are. Your business does not make you who you are. Your bank account does not make you who you are. You are who you are in God, created in His image. And what you do and what you own and what you have does not make you. I don't care if the American culture tries to make it that. It is not that because you can have all that and a bag of chips along with it and it's not going to give you the value that you need on the inside to give you the security that you need and most of that stuff can disappear in one day amen you matter more than you think you do even through difficult times even when things go wrong Jesus said about John the Baptist, he said in the midst of his worst moment, in the, doing the worst possible thing he could do, which is doubt Jesus, Jesus turns back around in the midst of it. And I'm sure John felt like a failure. His disciples probably thought, man, this guy's been preaching this his whole life and he's now going ask, asking us to go ask him if he's the one and he's the one that's been telling us he's the one. Now we got to go ask him if he's the one. And everybody around him probably felt that way. But I'll tell you what Jesus felt like. When they, they left, they, John didn't get to hear this, but after they left, Jesus said this. He said, man, make no mistake, he's the greatest of the great. You matter more than you think you do. I'm waiting for a better amen. You matter more than you think you do. Listen, mom and dad, you matter more than you think you do. Mom and dad, you matter more than... Hey, grandma and grandpa, you matter more than you think you do. You think that you don't listen to that old fogey stuff anymore, but you matter more than you think you do. Great grandparents, quit listen. Don't you discount yourself. You matter more than you think you do. Prayer on me. You matter more than you think you do. 
Nursery workers, you matter more than you think you do. Ushers, you matter more than you think you do. Praise and worship team, you matter more than you think you do. Tech teams, you matter more than you think you do. All children's youth ministry, every ministry involved in every area of servanthood in this church. Greeters, everyone. Listen, you uh, VIP, you matter more than you think you do. You may be putting yourself down, but Jesus is bragging on you. In fact, he went on to say, he that is least in the kingdom of God is even greater than John the Baptist. You matter more than you think you do. Come on, clap one more time. <laughs> Telling you what we learned from this great giant through the ministry of Jesus. So number one, well, that's actually number three, but we'll call it number three. You're doing better than you think you are. You matter more than you think you do. And lastly, I'm going to say it again because this is the last point I'm going to make and then I'm leaving. You're doing better than you think you are. You matter more than you think you do. And number three, it's less about you than you think it is. You matter more. Uh, you're doing better than you think you are. You matter more than you think you do. But it's less about you than you think it is. Amen, Pastor Jeff. Uh oh, Pastor Jeff just threw me a curve. I don't like that last one. <laughs> I don't like that last one, right? It's less about you than you think it is. Amen, Pastor Jeff. You see, because it's really God's anointed you in your life. He's given you gifts, but it's those anointings, those giftings really aren't even about you. They're about other people. It's about Jesus, and it's about His will, and it's about other people. It's less about you than you ever thought. It's more about Jesus. It's more about other people. It's more about the people you can touch with those blessings that God gives you. Amen. So just remember as you go through life and God blesses you and He anoints you, it's not about you. It's about the people that anointing is going to touch and heal and bring life to. Why? Because we're followers of Jesus. And you know what? In the life and ministry of Jesus, He lived His whole life for other people. He didn't die for Himself. He died for others. He didn't become a man for himself. He became a man for others. He didn't suffer for himself. He suffered for others. He was wounded for your transgressions. He was bruised for your iniquities. Why? Because it was about others. It's less about you than you think it is. Amen? There was a car broke down on the side of the road way back in the day when cars broke down more. I don't mean the 70s. I mean further back beyond that. Um, uh, but, uh, and it was broke down and this huge limousine pulls up next to the car. And this, you know, this was way back in the early 1900s. And big limousine pulls up and the guy gets out with his big shiny suit. And he, in this shiny suit, he lifts the hood and starts working on that car and, 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 and look, does this and does that and works on it and gets it fixed. And the guy says, man, thank you so much for fixing my car. How much do I owe you? How much do you, you, you helped me so much. Oh, thank you so much for helping me. Thank you for helping me. How much do I, oh, he said, you don't owe me anything. He said, listen, uh, my name's Henry Ford, and I created that car. And it don't look good for me when you're sitting on the side of the road. This ain't about you, it's about me. Let me tell you something, God created you. And he doesn't like it when you're broke down. He doesn't like it when you're on the side of the road. He likes you fixed, man. He likes you running. He likes you tweaked. He likes you moving down the road. Amen. And I'll close with this about John the Baptist. Is Number four, is John always, always pointed people to Jesus. If you and I can just do that one thing, and that is, is use, if you, want to be, you want to be a giant, use everything you have your whole life to point people to Jesus, not to you, not to a denomination, not to a church. Point them to Jesus. Point people to Jesus your whole life with everything you own. Let your car bring people to Jesus. Let your social media account be used for the purpose of pointing and bringing people to Jesus. Let your money be used to bring people to Jesus. Whatever influence, whatever you own, whatever influence, whatever platform, let it point to Jesus. And if you can do that one thing, you'll be running with giants.
Because that was, you say, what was John's secret? What made him the greatest? He was the one guy on the planet that pointed every, his whole life. He said, I must decrease, but he must increase. The secret to his life, I must decrease so that Christ can increase. And everything I own, everything I have, everything I do, everything I possess must be used to point people to Jesus Christ because we are the forerunners of the second coming of Christ and the anointing of Elijah and the Elijah and the and the anointing of John the Baptist is on the church in this generation. If you receive that anointing, shout amen one time. Those of you watching by internet, just shout amen one time right there where you're at. Father, we thank you. We thank you right now. We have the spirit of John the Baptist on us. And we're running with giants. The Pauls and the Davids and the Jonathans and the Esthers and the Noahs. We're running with giants. The Abrahams and the Moses. We're running with the Jacobs. We're running with giants. We're running with the John, the Apostle John. We're running with John the Baptist running with giants. Help us. Help us to keep pace. Help us to understand the truths and the principles that allow us to finish our course and run